Welcome to the Women Who Code podcast. My name is Yamiche Wolfson. I am so excited to be with you all today. We are going to focus on not just my story, but how my story really leads to tangible, actionable steps for yourself, for your community, and for all of us as a global society. And the title of this is Rags to Riches, Inspiring Tales of Triumph and Resilience. And you know, when I was coming up with this title, I wanted to get something that really summarized my journey so far into entrepreneurship, link my life, my story, my roots, my family, my culture, all into a couple of words. And I hope that from this podcast, you're going to hear all of these elements leading into rags to riches, inspiring tales of triumph and resilience. So let's go ahead and get started. And it would always start as any good story with one character who is just like the hero. And my hero now and probably forevermore is going to be my mom. My siblings and I like to define her Genesis story as $20 and a dream. She is a Ghanaian woman who immigrated to the United States of America at the ripe age of 19 years old. And as we like to make fun of her, all she had was $20 and a dream. We're still waiting on Pixar, Disney, someone to make this an actual movie. But until then, we'll continue to use this uh, slogan and make fun of her a little bit with it. But even though we make jokes about it, it truly is my mother's story. Much like any other immigrant, she came to this country with hopes that with even the little she had, she was gonna be able to do a lot. And like any woman, statistics show, history shows, when we think about impact, we don't think about individuals. We don't think about ourselves. We think about communities. We think about large scale impact, whether it be our family, our generations, our local community, our town, our village. That is how women are wired. And so my mom came here and basically sacrificed her dreams and her gifts and her talents to do something she knew would easily work and bring her an income that would be able to serve as a foundation and a springboard for my siblings and I. So my mom was a registered nurse for over 30 years working the graveyard shift because that's the shift where you get the most money. <laughs> and that's the shift where she could still see us in the morning and in the afternoon, and she would just have to have someone take care of us that night. And so my mom sacrificed what I see now as a grown human being, as her gifts with people, her strong emotional intelligence, her ability to make everyone and anyone feel comfortable and laugh and feel loved, her strong sense of critical thinking and her ability to be very, very precise in areas of writing, science, math, reading, et cetera, et cetera. No one knows all the places my mom could have gone. And sometimes I take the time to think about it. And that's what even pushes me to do the work that I'm doing today. Because when my mom sacrificed all that she could have been to be able to fuel and finance my siblings and I and our dreams, I never forgot that. And growing up, I always held it as a burden on my own shoulder that if I am standing on the shoulders of my mom, who decided to be the person that not only my siblings and I stand upon, but our entire family stands upon for socioeconomic growth. I had something to do to help other people 
just as my mom laid down her life to help other people. And so as I went through high school and I was constantly being selected for awards and being selected for academic achievement, I always saw it in alignment with getting to places so that other Black women could get to those places faster. I had this very strong sense of understanding that I learned from my mom that once you blaze a trail, you really make it easy for other people to follow behind you. And though it's not always the sexiest thing to be a trailblazer, even though they try to make it seem sexy, the impact lasts beyond you. And so when I got a full ride to the University of Virginia from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, that was another defining moment for me because now I had no financial ties to getting my education. Funny enough, my friends and I always like to joke that I was one of the few Black students <laughs> who actually got paid to go to school. Every semester, I would receive a lump sum of money to be able to support my living, my accommodation, et cetera, et cetera not only from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but from the hundreds of thousands of dollars and additional scholarships that I had also earned while in high school. And so I took that as the ability to go far fast. I mean, how many Black girls from Newark, New Jersey, do you know are sitting at University of Virginia, one of the top universities in the country at that time, I believe it was like number one or number two public universities in all of America. And you have nothing to pay. You're literally just here to learn. You have all the opportunity to make what was a blank canvas, a beautiful work of art. And so I was like, I am not gonna take this for granted. And as I did that, I built relationships. I joined organizations. I was the only freshman on the executive board for the Black Student Union at University of Virginia. And I was really maximizing my time at UVA, or so I thought. And I was even able to win the standout first year award for my entire class. And that was really a very strong defining moment as well. Because for me, all I could see was progress. All I could see was continued celebration, awards, and increase all around. From my senior year to the end of my freshman year, I was on cloud nine. And when sophomore year came around, I thought everything was just gonna go the same way. But there's a unique phenomenon that I believe happens between the summer of freshman year into the fall of your sophomore year. And where most students start to really think about the rest of their college career and they start to make some defining decisions. Unbeknownst to me though, I didn't know Everyone was like, oh, based off of my first year, this is what I'm going to change. This is what I'm going to do. I didn't know that all of the people of color and women of color who were surrounding me as we were all going towards this, you know, finance degree at the time were soon going to come to campus and say they switched their major. And it was really baffling to me how many of us had already began to drop out from what are called STEM majors, engineering, math, science. Um, and so I continued at first. I thought nothing would go wrong. Maybe they just found out that they didn't love it. But I know I want to be in STEM. I know I love math. I know my dad is a math whiz. And this is going to be something that is for me. But as I soon continue to go along in my sophomore year, or as we like to say at UVA, my second year, I also started to see that maybe I don't belong here. And I don't belong here because no one else who looks like me is really here. 
And the people who do look like me, it doesn't seem like we're flying by. <laughs> it seems like it is a daily struggle to just want to pursue a major. We're not even in our career yet. And all of these things, I started to register them in my mind as defining moments that told me I wasn't good enough. I wasn't worthy. I couldn't make it in STEM. And some people are like, oh, well, you know, there's role models. There's people who have done it before you. And to that question or to that point, I would ask a question. Name five Black women in STEM and don't Google it. And if you're like most of the people that I've spoken to and I've asked, him, I've asked that question to, you cannot name me five trailblazing Black women in STEM. And it's not because we haven't been there, but we've been hidden. And many of the stories of our success were never written down. They were never vocalized and they were never shared. And so for a young first generation, Ghanaian American, low income student at University of Virginia, there wasn't anyone I thought I could look up to or knew about to look up to. And all of that led to what we all now define as imposter syndrome. But when I was going through it, it just seemed like a really good explanation to why I shouldn't be in that room. And so I left. Like every human being who doesn't feel welcome, doesn't think it's for them, we tend to leave rooms that we should be in, we can be in, and we deserve to be in. And so I left from pursuing a finance degree, math, to pursuing sociology and women gender sexuality studies, where I saw women who look like me. I actually had professors who look like me. And it was something that people could also easily give me role models for. Now I ask you the question again, how many Black women do you know who have been civil rights leaders, social justice leaders, social leaders generally. And most people can name at least two. And so I found role models there. I found hope there. I found a pathway there because there were so many Black women who had more of an amplified story within the social sciences and the world of women, gender, sexuality studies than probably any other major at university. And luckily for me, though I was no longer pursuing a very technical major or what they call to be a technical major, I had still built the social capital and the relationships to help me pursue what I initially came into pursue, which was to go into business. And with the help of a strong community of Black women, I wasn't allowed to give up on myself completely. They made sure that the amount of energy and the amount of belief and confidence I walked into UVA with, that I didn't forget who that Nyamiche was. And through their support, their handholding, or what I would like to call their dragging, <laughs> I applied to so many programs I never thought I was qualified for. And I got into many, if not all of them. Being able to intern and do programs with top companies like PwC, McKenzie & Company, JP Morgan, and finally get a full-time offer to Google for my postgraduate career. And since I got it very early into my fall semester, my senior year, I had time to do what the guidance counselors and all the deans and everyone always told you to do in your senior year, to reflect. Reflect on your career, reflect on what you've learned and how you've grown, and really think about who you are, who you want to become, and also what you want to change. And for me, I couldn't get over my success, and not in a prideful way. I couldn't wrap my mind around how I had this success. There were no other Black girls going to Google that I knew of from my class. 
there were very few, if any, Black girls who had a trajectory and a resume like I did. And it reminded me of my senior year of high school. How come I was always the one to get all of these things? How special am I? How smart am I? How good looking am I? Am I any better than anyone else? That it seems like all of these things just always happen to usually go to me. And most of the other women who look like me have little to no replication of that in their own story. I know some Black women who graduated UVA and went to work for Chick-fil-A, which isn't a problem necessarily. But when you think about the debt and the goals and everything they had, I'm sure they weren't the most excited to end up at Chick-fil-A after four years of studying. And that question really made me humble because I realized that there likely is, just statistically, someone smarter than me. There's likely someone who has more grit than me, more passion, more desire. And not only just one person, there are likely a lot of Black women I went to school with at UVA who would have wanted to work at the same companies I did or at least similar competitors. But there was so few of us. So few of us who had a job, so few of us who actually stayed in a STEM major. And I really started to take my sociology and my women gender studies learning into practice. And I knew that this wasn't an issue about Yamache. This wasn't a micro issue. This was a macro issue with many, many, many stories that are felt on a micro level. And I just happened to be one of those stories. And I was lucky and blessed enough to have people around me who made sure I didn't end up like most Black women who drop out of their STEM major by their sophomore year. And if you're wondering how many Black women do that, almost 50%, almost 50% 50 of Black women drop out of their STEM major by their sophomore year. We're losing almost half of the amount of women who have already indicated interest. We're losing half of those stories, of those innovations, of those hopes, of those dreams, over those capacities. We are losing it. And this is not just a problem on a social level. And as the founder of Black Sisters in STEM, an organization set out to fix this issue, I always like to bring the data. And I like to make sure people understand that we stand as an organization with a rightful cause. However, a very tangible political and economic need that we're solving for as an organization. So I'm going to give you just a couple of data points for you to think about. Black women have some of the highest indications of declaring a STEM major or actually declaring a STEM major when they get to university. Yet Black women also have some of the highest dropout rates of a STEM major. Black women are students who are likely to be classified as low-income students. Low-income students in the U.S., less than 20% of them actually complete any degree within six years of starting. Most of the reasons, actually the number one reason why low-income students who tend to be Black women drop out or do what we call stop out are because of financial hurdles. Black women are also the fastest growing female workforce demographic in the world. And so as I say some of these statistics, I hope you are starting to see the socioeconomic importance, what I argue to be 
one of the most powerful levers of change in our next century, economically, politically, and socially, will be Black women. And with the world and all of the industries of the world asking questions about AI, I'm sure you wouldn't argue with me that some of the most prominent, lucrative, and open industries will come out of what we call STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Whether it's in agriculture, healthcare, education, everything is going to be affected by this one acronym, STEM. And if we do not, or if we continue to not support Black women and ensure that Black women have the access, the training, the safe space to believe they can, we are losing enormous contributions that will unlock economic opportunity for our country, for our cities, for our state, and truly for the world. And so Black Sisters in STEM is here to be that bridge, here to be the catalyst that makes sure that we are actually on the side of history that will make us proud. For so long, the history of Black women in this country of America has been riddled with pain and trauma. And even if we may not have been a part of setting up those systems and structures, we all are a part of bringing them down. And at Black Sisters in STEM, we see ourselves as the organization that will be the ones to help bring those down, but we don't wanna do it alone. We wanna do it with the help of every single human being on this planet, because each of us are writing the future right now as we speak. Our actions, our inaction leads to the future that we're gonna have. And so at Black Sisters in STEM, we are launching a three-year initiative called the Turning Point Fund. This fund is a fund led by Black women for Black women to be able to solve for the major financial hurdles that have kept Black women from an industry that they not only want to be in, but the world needs them to be in. Equity in STEM is no longer a philosophical hope. It's an economic strategy. It is the benefit for the growth of our nation. Nations like China, on the other hand, have recognized this and they have very strong levels of gender parity in STEM. And they've worked on the public, private and social sectors to make that happen. Statistics say because of their unified efforts to raise up a STEM workforce, they are likely going to have up to 20 times as much of a STEM workforce than some countries in the world. The US, though known for its STEM workforce, is actually trailing behind that by a lot. And we are set to have the most economic loss of any country if we are not able to effectively equip and train a workforce that would be able to use and understand the skill sets of the future, which are mostly in the fields of STEM. And so our three-year campaign to make sure that we are supporting Black women to get there is to support every single Black woman. Our goal is 1,000 with $4,200 that would help her support her certification needs, internship stipends, conference stipends, abilities to get technology that she needs like laptops or softwares to be more effective and to be ahead of her industry. And we're hoping to do that with people like yourself. And so if you would like to join us to bring forth the dreams and the capacity of a demographic so left behind, hidden, and a lot of times forgotten. You can join us at blacksis.org.
where you'll find everything that I just said on a web page and the ability to be a donor. We're looking to have 300 people commit just $500 one time to be able to raise a huge amount of money to support Black women, support Black futures, and to support economies around the world. And so when we talk about rags to riches, it's really a story of hope. It's a story that we will one day be able to let the talent, the gifts, and the great minds across the world, regardless of skin, color, race, gender, have the opportunity to utilize those gifts, those talents, and their great mind without any limits. And I know that whether you have children, nieces, nephews, mentees, that you too want a world where we're defined by what is in our heart and in our mind and not what we didn't even have a choice around being our gender and our race and our color. And so I hope you all join us. And this is the Women Who Code podcast with Yamiche Wilson, founder and CEO of Black Sisters in STEM. And until we meet again, I hope that you will continue to be someone filled with hope and utilize your hope to make the next generation better than how you found your generation. Thank you.